Okay, I had a pre-show topic. I just thought since it's not directly Linux related, we probably shouldn't do it in the main show. But I want to talk to you guys about it because you got to wonder if there's going to be anything that changes for Linux. You have to hope not. But everybody saw the news that Microsoft purchased Mojang for $2.5 billion and uh, Notch is on his way out the door already. And, you know, you guys probably also saw because uh, it was grabbed in the uh, last subreddit comments that... Microsoft explicitly said they don't have any plans to change mine to, to to change where they deliver to Mac, PC, Xbox, PlayStation, and mobile. But they didn't actually say Linux. Do you think I'm being paranoid? Oh, it's definitely an elephant in the room. They didn't thought about. It. I think a they didn't fuck even Marcus who wrote that. <laughs> but <laughs> but to be fair, is like they. I think Microsoft is trying to become what they were before. A software company and that means producing software for whatever it's selling so you think uh you think it would be silly for them to uh to pull to the... cut it up. yeah i think so, so right i hope so, so so uh the whole thing is if they go and the only way to make what they're doing right now totally microsoft centric so that it can't run on other uh, operating systems would be to actually to do to do to actually undo what they've done that's good and what is to Java standard and to murder it and do stupid things like instead of doing it from uh, a canonical URL to something or canonical uh, uh, c connection to something, which is just assuming and going backwards from where you are and then finding something else in the file system. Maybe they'd have to go and sharp. like state some kind of awful way to go say, oh, look for the C drive. Well, and so... Uh, that's so. So before we go like way down in the weeds, there. That's way down there. Don't you think it's more likely that uh, what would happen is Microsoft will continue to deliver Minecraft as we know it today to all the places that Minecraft is shipped, but then maybe yes. in the future there could be like themed versions of Minecraft or specific like Minecraft. Uh, I don't want to call them spin-offs, but I can't think of a better term that maybe would be exclusive to the Xbox platform or uh, no, Windows this Mobile is, first. This is, this is all about Windows Mobile. This is all about Windows Mobile, nothing else. So they, they need they need a they, great game for Windows Mobile. They need the killer app for Windows Windows. They phone. need the number and, one seller on iOS. And when when like the kid goes into the phone shop with the parents and the parents have got the money and they say, Right, which oh. phone do you want? The question is, does it run Minecraft? And you know, every kid in, in my kid's school, all the kids play Minecraft. Right. All of them without fail. Right. And when they go to a like have a party over at someone's house, they sit there and pull out their phones and yep. they do peer to peer yep. playing Minecraft yep. together. I've it's, seen the same and thing. It, and, it, and if you're the guy with the Windows phone, you're like the loser. You can't <laughs> join in. You know, it's it's horrible peer pressure. Huh. But, and it's a thing we teach our kids not to succumb to. But you know. Yeah, I think it is. Happen. So, but how do you? So, okay. So obviously, outside of I mean, do you really think they'd spend 2.5 bill and buy something that is so counter to the Microsoft culture, right? Because Minecraft's all about how the community has embraced it and extended it and built their own servers. It's a huge freaking Java app, right? This is so counter to anything that is normally uh, in the Microsoft realm of expertise. So there's no way they're, they're doing all of this just to make a Windows mobile port. It has to be much bigger than that. I mean, outside of even insane. merchandising and things like that, I think, I think they've got to make exclusives out of this property. Well, it's sure. like I've been saying. I think we're going to start seeing a new Microsoft. I mean, this is I the same... I don't think it's new. I think it's just the old Microsoft, the actual old Microsoft, the original one. The original one was endorsing Apple like hell when it made sense for them. They just grew too much and uh, decided to take to their own hands. Come on, that they were worked. putting a backstab them the entire time. Working. Yeah, I, working. I think so too. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I see what your point is. This would be a much more mature Microsoft, one that really is truly more interested in just creating software for all platforms, and and, and maybe it'll be that. Okay, so let's, let's shift gears from this. Doesn't this also kind of guarantee, like, more support's going to be going towards, like, MindTest and other open-source Minecraft uh, alternatives? I hope so. It could do, uh, uh, but you, it would. They would. They need to step up their game. Yeah. So, but there's already uh, other different, like Glowstone Project. All this came out of the big craps bucket fiasco, and it's already started. And I think this has only improved it and sped it up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I think, like uh, Popey said, it's going to be. There's a long time to go, and now, if Microsoft does it right, they're going to have more money behind Minecraft. Perhaps they could be. 
maybe they can make that even a better product even faster. So there could be more competition for mind tests to keep up with. We'll see. We will see. Stay tuned and find out. Hopefully it doesn't mean anything bad for Linux users. I don't think it will. Um, all right, yeah. See, I didn't really think that was a main show topic, but I thought it was worth chatting about just because I know it's a popular game on Linux. You know, that's what my son plays it on. He has a, uh, well, now I'm going to put it, I don't know if it'll play on the Chromebook. I'm going to, um, I guess I, I could try. Get it so that my son can see it and see what he thinks. Yeah, I've got it. It's an own Chromebook or an Intel. No, it's a C720. Uh, is that Intel? Should be fine. Yeah, that's Intel. Uh, it's got um, it's got uh, elementary OS on it right now, but he's got a uh, HP laptop at home that has Antigros on it that has Minecraft installed, and that works really well for him. And interestingly, too, I I didn't expect this, but he's taken much better to the uh, trackpads on a laptop than uh, a mouse because. He started with touchscreen devices and then moved to the computer. He kind of graduated up to the computer. And so the touch on the pad, on the touchpad, on the click pad, made much more sense to him than the mouse. Now, he's learned the mouse, too, but uh, he just almost immediately was able to translate touchscreen to trackpad, which I didn't quite expect because it's not really a one-to-one thing. But How old is he? Five. So Sam started off with a mouse and uh, keyboard, Minecraft. And then eventually I bought it on the Xbox 360, and he now favors the controller. He's no mm. son of mine. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a mouse and keyboard WASD <laughs> kind of guy. Wow. But he, yeah, he's, he's big, you know, him and Sophie as well, who's 11. She's much prefers the, the controller now, finds it a lot more accurate. And I can't do they use it. the controller on the PC or are they sticking to the console? They generally only use the console because they they use the multiplayer um, thing with the what's the camera thing connect. Oh yeah, and yeah. they they chat to their friends. So does that mean no custom servers? Like how does uh, that work well, they, on the console? Are there they make their own servers and their friends they invite their friends they're called parties and they're persistent and they worlds. Their, uh, yeah, yeah, they come back to there's there's, there's, there's there's like a hundred of them saved on the Xbox. I don't know where they are. They're in the cloud probably. Yeah, so they're hosted like on the Xbox Live servers. I guess so. Yeah. Huh. So it's way easier than PC servers. Yeah. Because you don't have to actually, worry about, you know, spinning up a VPS. But you can only play with other, it's only other console custom worlds. Yes. Like, you can't go console to PC. Correct. But there's a, tr- a ton of people who have Xbox and Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's like a huge game on there. I think I think they looked at it as a huge game on iOS. It's a huge game on, on the Xbox. And they went, huh, you know what we should do? We should probably own that. And plus, you see, you got Notch there. He's like, yeah, I don't want to be part of a big company. I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, it was just sort of, I mean, wow. I think it was the time was right. He, I think he, I think it's pretty accurate what he was saying that he, you know, I I don't think that was a cop out. And I think it was fair to say that he's not CEO material. You can tell from, you know, his tweets and stuff. He likes just hacking around on stupid games and stuff and playing Let Em Dare and, and, you know, entering competitions. And that's not CEO material. CEOs don't do that. Um, so I can see why he wanted to sell it. And, you know, two years ago or whatever, he said a billion is my price. And the only company who's going to pay two billion for Minecraft is Microsoft. Yeah, so, with yeah. their nice overseas cash pile. Uh, Blaster, are you a Minecraft player? Uh, yes. I um, didn't know that. And actually, the, the, uh, server on, the servers on uh, Xbox Live actually don't, they're not spun up on Microsoft servers. You actually host it on your console and then the party connects to you. So, so your friends can't have to spin like, up. You have to spin like up the mobile version. Yeah, you have to spin up your save, and then some people have to connect to you while you're online. Oh, and so then once you close Minecraft, it's offline. Wow, that's interesting. That well, makes yeah, mo- so it works, that makes sense. It though, works almost exactly like the mobile version. Okay, I like see. I like the idea of a persistent world that people can be visiting all the time. That's I think one of the coolest things when we had active. I don't know if they still are active or not. The Minecraft servers for Jupiter Broadcasting. You just go in oh, there. Oh God, yeah, they are totally active. Are they, yeah, so you can go in there, and there's just tons of people working on stuff. So that's really yeah, my, cool. My, my, my kids play cool. on that as well. And that's that's another thing is having a game that your kids can play, which is a safe environment. Yeah. Like if it's if it's a curated server like Jupiter is, where you know that the people aren't gonna, you know, mess about with your kids and you're not gonna get dangerous people talking to them, you can leave them playing on the PC for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's cool. When my kids come in and they say, Hey dad, do you wanna play on the J B server? That's quite cool, you know? Yeah, it is really cool. And I like the idea, too, that, I mean, I think, sure, you could make the argument that, you know, it has to be maybe try to be balanced with 
with other things. But it's, at the same time, it's like out of all the video games you could play for kids, Minecraft really seems like it's got to be not like he- like super like healthy or educational or something, but it seems like it's it's cultivating something like a creativity and building and problem solving and 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 sure. and, and resource they're, they're, management yeah. and all of these things that are actually really good life skills. Yeah. Uh, okay. You, you know, you can try and make an argument for it in the same way that when I had a Sinclair Spectrum back in 1980, I would try and make the argument that I was doing my homework. <laughs> right. Which yeah, yeah, yeah. Fat <laughs> <and lie. laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the, uh, yeah. the same thing goes with Minecraft. Yeah. I'm, yeah. It's educational, Mum. Really. It yeah. Is. But um, it's also yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. You know, but the Joe thing is, my kid- Minecraft Me has a really cool server too. Yeah. I've yeah, seen they- some of the stuff they have on there. Yeah. Yeah. They have a really great server. I love that my son learned about smelting and different types of trees mm. from Minecraft. That's it, quite cool. That is really cool. Hmm. Well, the only thing I was thinking that maybe would change, like, the game, like, I, I would, if I was going to look at my crystal ball, it seems like they're still going to ship to all the same platforms. They're probably not going to remove any features. They'll probably make some things better and maybe make it more developer accessible. But then you got to wonder if, like, years down the road, if there's just like really hard things to measure that just never pan out. Like this is a bad example, I think, but I'm working on the idea still. Like say like say like on Mojang's like five year roadmap, they have like this really awesome Twitch slash YouTube live streaming integration. I made the argument in Tech Talk today that potentially like maybe it was even gonna be server side where on the Linux server you'd have like this virtual camera that could live stream multiple angles to different streaming services, right? Well now that uh, now that Microsoft owns it you know they're not gonna they're not gonna integrate a feature that connects directly into Google's live streaming platform or their or Amazon's now either. So there could be some things like that that would have been cross pollination because Mojang was independent and didn't have any entrenched market interest that would influence those types of decisions. Now now that freedom has been removed from them, and there's going to be those types of biases that will sort of form the future direction of what the game can and cannot do. That's already happened once in the the twitch tv integration is windows only mm. wow that sucks yeah yeah i mean screw those guys right screw but those that's guys. that's more i think that's more that they're using a third-party library so whenever you bring in third-party stuff that you haven't written you're dependent upon whatever platforms they support and the whatever library they've used for twitch tv doesn't support anything other than windows i believe Oh, yeah, man. it's it's because it's not Java at all. I actually believe it's a, a DLL file that gets brought down. Oh, sweet! DLC. I love DLLs. I know. Sweet. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful thing? You know how Dynamic I like. You know how I like my libraries. Dynamic. And late. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's prepared to finally just break down and invest in a caffeine IV. My name is Chris. <laughs> My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Oh, man. I did one of these things where I I had a couple of rough nights, and then I was dumb last night, and I, I had too much to drink, Matt. I had too much to drink, and you I just- woke up in the middle of the night with a hangover, like in the middle of the night, and I couldn't go back to sleep. And it wasn't even that much. I'm just a lightweight now, Matt. What's that mean? Does that mean I'm getting too old to drink? I got to just stick to my prune you- juice. You need the chat room there to like tell you all the things that you should have done beforehand because right. that usually really helps. That's Especially true. Like you know, hey Chris, you need to drink more water. Right. You yeah, need yeah. HTML5. Right. You, know, you need some other stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, I do like to get. I do like the hindsight 2020 uh, advice yeah. that the chat room yeah, is so awesome. good at providing. <laughs> And, and they're doing it out of love. I mean, it's yeah. a great thing. It yeah. is, but it's but it is comical. All so. right. So uh, we're gonna do a show today out of love. We got a lot of your feedback to get through this week. Some really good stuff. I've picked the best of the best. Uh, and then Aaron Saigo took to Google Plus early one morning and said the community manager role is a fraud and a farce. And uh, we'll break it down. We'll talk about it. I have a feeling that uh, there may be some disagreements in the show today on that topic. And we'll bring yeah. in our mumble room. Uh, and then after that, we're going to get into a few other topics, time remaining and pertaining, including potentially a little bit of info about some future changes coming to some Linux distributions near you. So we'll talk about all of that stuff as well as some additional links towards the end of the show. Got a got a lot of stuff to cover today. I'm just going through it right now. I'm looking at the papers and I'm thinking, dang, this is looking like a pretty busy week. I think our news cycle has come back. I think I think the news is starting nice. to pick back up again. In fact, um we uh you know we've seen some really big things go down this week. So I think we're gonna have a huge news segment on the Linux action show on Sunday. But today our duty is to focus on the feedback focus on the people. And so Stefan writes in and he says, uh, hey, Chris and Matt, I don't know if you have already seen the leaked preview of Windows 9. 
Uh, but in case you didn't know, there's quite some, let's call it progress, in this hell of a stagnation that Microsoft calls Windows. Anyways, to keep it short, they integrated multiple workspaces. Oh, nice. Uh, and finally, de- when they finally developed something usable. However, you might think it looks a little familiar. My biggest concern is that almost uh, is that I almost hear these efforts at Microsoft fanboys claim that Microsoft opened up a whole new perspective of user experiences. And I can predict that if you tell them multiple workspaces isn't something new because Apple and Linux had this for years, they'll respond with, but Microsoft made it awesome and usable. So have you seen this uh, this implementation of virtual desktops on Windows 9? I have, and um, just, the, just the interface as a whole, not just the implementation, but the interface as a whole is the best box of Crayola crayons I've ever seen. I mean, it's like... <laughs> yeah, I, the, it the, is the very, yeah. It looks like iOS 7 smacked Windows. It. Absolutely. We throw enough color at it, people are going to think it looks great. And that, and just, I, I'm so blown away at how they come up with concepts. I can't even wrap my brain around it. I don't even, I don't even know. I don't even know. So uh, I have it in the video version here. You can see their dynamic workspaces, uh, a la GNOME, and, uh, or, and, and, and of course other desktops as well. I guess actually Mac OS X has dynamic uh, workspaces as well. Uh, and then you can see you can drag the windows around and move them. Uh, I... You know, I mean, I'm not going to use this because I don't use Windows. I guess it's nice to have it for Windows users, finally. It is, I think what is interesting is, like, remember how, like, Windows 8 came out and Microsoft's all like, yeah, so the desktop's dead. We have that classic interface, quote-unquote, when you need it. But you should do everything in the new modern UI. That's the future. And now this version of Windows is coming out, and they're like, hey, so we know you like the desktop, so we're going to give you more desktops. You can, in fact, have unlimited desktops. (laughs) How about some desktops, everybody? Exactly, and it's like, and not only that, but we're going to borrow it. We're going to we're going to travel back in time and basically be, provide an implementation that, quite honestly, looks a bit dated. Um, yeah, it looks opinion. actually I a little clunky to me. It's not very smooth. It does. Feels a little bit like a, a little bit like an early uh, KDE, maybe two point something kind of. They need you know, to rust up some cookies on top of something, and I they, don't know. Just, they need to add a little, a uh, little, a uh, little. Uh, yeah. Animation factor in there. Give it some. Give there it some jazz, go. right? Put a little jazz in that virtual biz. desktop. Yeah, right. Microsoft biz. There you go. <laughs> yeah, because that's what a makes it usable. Spinning cube. Uh, yeah, the lot of spinning cube. It is funny though. So when they decide to reinvest in the desktop and uh, sort of double down on it, what do they do? They go rip off features from Unix desktops. Absolutely. So there you One go. One stop shopping. Redmond has indeed restarted their copy machines. So uh, yeah, I thought we'd just. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's always fun to kind of you know poke at my uh, poke at Microsoft. I mean, come on, we had to. It's so easy. So, Eric, you're here, right? You're still here, Eric. Good. Uh, Uh, We have a question that uh, is right up your alley. So, Scotty ZA uh, writes in. He says, hello, I'm loving, with a U, all the JB awesomeness. I have a new Dell PC on the way. The first thing I'm going to do is dropkick Windows 8 and install some Ubuntu goodness on there. It's going to be the GNOME variety of it. The Dell comes with a touchscreen, and I was wondering how the GNOME touch, touch gestures are, and if there's anything I need to watch out for or things that could improve the experience. Pseudo thanks, Scotty ZA. So, Eric, I know you got a touchscreen laptop. You've been trying out GNOME, do. KDE, and Unity with it. What are your thoughts with regards to GNOME's sort of touch features that are there right now? Well, the GNOME touch features that are there right now in 3.12 are not up to the par of Unity yet. You can't resize your window. You can't... Uh, you can drag your windows, but only from the title bar. And... I've noticed that GNOME Shell will tend to crash every now and then if you try oh, that. Oh, really? So, Ouch. Yeah, it, so it's not up to par. GNOME 314 coming out later this month, if not the beginning of next month, uh, that should solidify their touchscreen. So 314, right now, though, yeah. in your experience so far, Unity is the champion when it comes to full touchscreen support? Correct. Yeah, and you also, does GNOME have an on-screen keyboard? Uh, I do, but I, you'd have... I'm not I, sure. I really don't know. It's handy. I'm sure you could get one. I mean, the, the one sure that comes could, with Unity yeah. is pretty nice, and it's it's really easy to use. It's, it's a standard one, yeah. so I think you could just load it anywhere. But anyways, yeah, so it sounds like... like it's Ubuntu GNOME. So what? You can close Windows. Maybe you could open the activities menu, but you're not going to be resizing Windows or dragging Windows around, or and there's no right, right click or anything like that? Right. There's no right click. It's just... It, it doesn't work very well. I mean, the best touchscreen interfaces they have is the activities menu itself, but also... Right. I would the, think so, yeah. Yeah, the activities menu itself is very touchscreen friendly, but also the lock screen. But beyond that, the window management um, in 3.12 is not up to par. Uh, 3.14 is getting there, is start, going to start to get there. Okay. And uh, I know I asked you, but you've been trying it out too on KDE uh, yeah. Plasma 4? 
Plasma 4 and Plasma 5, it's still not up to par. They haven't done anything with multi-touch gestures or anything. Okay. And by the way, a little correction, WikiLeaks pointed out, WikiLeaks pointed out in the chat room, we, GNOME 312 does not have this, but GNOME 314 is going to right. have a long press is right click. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. You know what? I've read about that. Right. Oh, yep. yes. Mm-hmm. I do recalls. Oh, do I hear music? Oh, yeah. Hey, it's my daily, it's my daily uh, collections call. Yeah, of course, I'm not in collections, but somebody is that gave out my number. So this is the default oh, Sailfish good. OS ringtone. Nice, right? I can dance to that. Doesn't that Very sound pleasant. good? Yeah. That sounds awesome. And I've got a cool uh, pirate ship in the background. <laughs> oh, I wasn't able to answer it in time. Oh, Darn. I really, I, really <laughs> like the, uh, I really like the Sailfish OS uh, 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 call interface, but it's a little funky because sometimes you have to swipe in a certain direction to answer the call, and it... Uh, if you're just late enough, it's that 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 animation of making the swipe is just long enough that you miss the call. It's all right. It's cool. I'm just experimenting with it. I'm just experimenting <laughs> with it. All right, Matt. You know what else I'm experimenting with? My mind over at LinuxAcademy.com. Go to LinuxAcademy.com/unplugged to get our special discount deal. LinuxAcademy.com/unplugged. So I've told you a lot about Linux Academy and how they're always working on their courseware, new features, and things like that. Well. Today, I got an email from Anthony, the founder of LinuxAcademy.com, and he says he's, he's passing along some of the new exciting things they're working on, and it's really something. He says, our new lab platform now allows the users to have four running Linux servers at one time. You can have any distribution you would like from a list, as well as two public host names for each server. You can even assign each server a role. Let's say you want to have a DB server and another one to be a DNS server. You can now label those roles to help you remember which lab you're working with, and you can have people, you can work with other people now. They have cool new learning plans, too, that allow users to select daily availability. And based on that availability, a study plan is automatically created for them. So you say, I have this much time available, and they will generate a plan that you can go through and learn something. Learning plans will give you the lessons and quizzes and labs that are due on each day, as well as even send you email reminders that you have items due on that day. Based on your availability, it will even give you a projected completion date of the course with some extra time included for studying. How freaking cool is nice. that, right? He says, That's we're also crazy. really excited to announce the immediate availability of a few extra courses we've been working on. Today, we've announced Chef Fundamentals, CentOS 7 Enterprise Updates, as well as Apache Tomcat. We've launched our Deploy and Manage OpenStack on Ubuntu and Icehouse, which is 50% complete, and they're working on it right now. We have a list of 14 upcoming courses throughout the remainder of the year. And he's going to send me updates when they've got them. Isn't that awesome? Now, you're thinking, sure, they're doing all this stuff. You know, real servers with host names that you have. You can have pub- people publicly log in. These automated coursewares, these learning plans, 350 new videos and content before the end of the year. More scenario-based learning labs than ever before. All of these new additions, no price increase. You just get them as part of your Linux Academy subscription. It just comes as part of the subscription. Go over to linuxacademy.com/unplugged right now. You'll get that 33% discount. That makes it a great deal. You can go over there and learn courses on RSync and OpenStack and AWS. Pick from any of the 7 plus Linux distributions. The courseware will automatically adjust the documentation so that way it matches the distribution you've chosen, which is a really great way to also get up to speed on another distro if you've taken on a job where they've changed, you, have, you have to change your distro. What a great way to get up to speed. Or you know, if you know it's time to finally make that RSync backup script. Why not go take the RSync courseware? And they're always adding new stuff, as well as live videos and all that kind of stuff. LinuxAcademy.com slash Unplugged. And a really big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring the Unplugged program. You guys rock and great work, you guys, on the new updates. That's crazy awesome. I love the yes. automated learning courses. That's, man. If I, go if get the, your learning on. Well, you I'm know? just thinking, like, you know, I could go in there and say, all right, I need a learning plan, and I've got, I've got you know, this much time this week to do it. I just, I love that. I, I think that's a really good system. All right, so Alec writes in, we had a ton, a ton, a ton of email uh, about our systemd discussion. And I think a couple of people felt like um, it was our first time, maybe they were kind of new to the show, and they didn't realize that we've done past episodes on this. So they felt, well, some people wrote <laughs> in and felt like we left some, some details out and sort of jumped in mid-conversation. So I apologize if that is how you felt. Uh, I would suggest maybe go check the Unplugged Back catalog. We've done a couple of episodes on it with some really good discussion that does fill in some of the background details. But Alec wrote in. He says, Hi, Chris, Matt, and Chatroom. And I thought Alec had one of the more interesting anti-System D concerns. Like, like he's not like uh, opposed to System D, but he's bringing up a concern about System D 
that I think maybe has some merit worth discussing, discussing outside of what we normally hear about, you know, some of the other issues that we've discussed before. He says, I want to chime in with my thoughts about the res- recent SystemD discussion. As a system administrator, I like SystemD and its innovative new features like DBus and socket activation. Yeah, here, you know what? I agree with that. However, I have some concerns about its long-term viability. From what I see, the main problem with SystemD is that it's a large attack surface, which could lead to security problems in the future. Also, because SystemD will be adopted by all Linux, I fear it could become a major target for attackers. In short, I think SystemD is a good thing for Linux right now, but in the future it could become insecure and unmaintainable. And because more and more projects are starting to depend on SystemD, it could become a painful process to move away from SystemD. Thanks for all the awesome shows, Alec. And I want to add to that, even outside of security, what about just code creep where something gets to be such a massive project and it, it impacts so many distributions and so many users whenever you change it that it sort of becomes like this weight, this anchor on Linux because you have this whole layer now that has to, that has to be updated and it has potentially dramatic effects across the board. Now, obviously there's ways and updates that maybe would have very minimal impacts, but you have to wonder if that could become a source of stagnation. Uh, I wonder what you think, Matt. Do you think there's a potential that maybe SystemD is going to make a a large attack surface for Linux, a common attack platform, or maybe an anchor that slows us down? Or do you think the folks at Red Hat and people working on SystemD can stay on top of it? I think at this point they can stay on top of it. I think it's going to be something that they need to be vigilantly uh, aware of and proactive on because you never know. It could develop into what you know what that concern addresses. But I think at this point it's too early to tell, and I don't see any point in borrowing trouble. I'm not saying to fall asleep at the wheel, but I'm just saying let's keep our eyes open. But at the same time, let's go ahead and keep pushing forward. It hasn't created any problems yet that are really significant that I'm aware of for my personal use. Others may have a, other gripes. I don't know. For me personally, it's been great. Okay, Daredevil, and you think it's not about security but something else? Yes. So we saw what happened. Like Linux, as uh, the kernel is super um, complicated now to get in as a maintainer or sure. to start contributing. It's famous and I for think that. That is kind of the problem that I find. Like not the security aspect. We can solve security aspects. Sure. I mean, we've been solving them in multiple fronts, and now there's even a specialized group for it. But I think companies getting a hold on who maintains system D now becomes more and more parts being just company control even though community always have a say that's actually more dangerous than uh, the security aspect yeah i think i think you have to you look at the kernel and you say yeah this the kernel is a not a, not a one to one uh, analog but it is an interesting way to compare it just a large bit, bit of code that that obviously impacts every linux distribution and even you know mobile devices and and yet yeah, we make that work don't we 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 have that working i think it's in part because we have the right people on the job and i feel like right now we have the right people on the job but these things can change i i do not know if i totally buy in with alec on the uh and i think alec's not the only one who's worried about the quote unquote system d lock in mm-hmm. i'm not so worried about that really uh, it's kind of a funny thing. It, one of the reasons we all want a free and open platform is because we want to avoid those problems. And then we still worry about those problems, even though it's open source code with documented APIs and things like that. So at some point, we kind of just have to acknowledge we have to adopt a technology, uh, but realize that we can build our way out, too, if we need to. I don't think it's as much lock-in as people think. Uh, all right, Fred, what do you think? Um, no, I just wanted to mention that I think um, there were this, these uh, patches to get uh, system D working on BSD systems uh, early, early, early days of system D, and they were not accepted because the the, the developers uh, thought they only wanted to target Linux and didn't accept patches for portability. Very good, and blackout uh, so, rightly. Riley points out, sorry, I just, just mentioned I didn't want to lose this track of this, almost 600 people contribute to SystemD, 200 alone in the last 12 months. So there's a lot of people that are working on SystemD. I think, uh, yeah. That seems like a lot of eyeballs. I mean, it seems like a lot of people have got their uh, fingers on the pulse and are watching what's going on. To me, that's my perspective. So here's what we did, is uh, Producer q 5 says put together a simple system D opinion survey that we've put out for folks to go uh, take advantage of and just plug through the questions and just so we can get a little data to kind of see where everybody's coming from in this where their heads at uh, Jack close your mic and uh, so it's a it's a simple system D opinion survey and it's up on the subreddit right now I'll have it linked in the show notes we've got quite a bit of responses Q5 is going to be releasing the results uh, in the future 
And uh, I don't, it's not like a definitive like scientific study, but I think it'd be interesting to see where people who have different opinions, where they all stand and what their experience level is and, uh, and things like that. So we'll have that linked in the show notes. And if you'd like to participate in the survey, we'll talk about the results in an upcoming episode. And also you can keep coming your, you can keep sending your system D feedback in. Uh, if you got something really good, we'll put it on air, but either way, I'll even read it so that way we can just at least incorporate it into our opinions. Hey, uh, speaking of producers, uh, so we just heard from Eric a little bit ago, and I want to plug something for uh, producer Michael, a.k.a. Rotten Corpse. Uh, you Get Beta 2 is coming and available for beta testing, uh, and You Get is a great downloader for Linux. We've covered it before in Linux Action Show, and Rot- Rotten Corpse is uh, one of the developers for it, and they just put out a new beta for their brand new version coming out. So we'll link to that in the show notes. It's a great downloader you get. And uh, it's my preferred way if I download large ISO images and I don't want to leave my browser running. And I'm do- I like, you know, if I'm not doing the torrent, I generally do the torrent. But if for some reason I'm doing an HTTP download, boom, boom. There you go. You gets where it goes, Matt, like a bouse. Nice. Like a bouse. Hey, uh, speaking of like a bouse, I want to tell you about something else that's like a bouse, and that's DigitalOcean. Go over to DigitalOcean.com right now. DigitalOcean.com. Now, not just walk, not just trot, but full-on gallop, because we've got a promo code that will get you two months for free of a DigitalOcean droplet. I know, it's crazy. If you use the promo code Unplugged September, you're going to get armed with a $10 credit. Oh, so you mm. see that value there. You get For $10, oh, yeah. you get two months of DigitalOcean service. Why? Because they have pricing plans that start at only $5 per month. That'll get you a 512 megabyte RAM droplet with a 20 gigabyte SSD, one blazing fast CPU, and a terabyte of transfer connected to tier one bandwidth. You don't know what DigitalOcean is? My friend, DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. And they've got droplet centers everywhere. Or I mean, maybe you call them data centers. I don't know. Say like, oh, I don't know, New York, you heard of that? You heard of New York, right? San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, and they're rolling out new features all the time. Their interface is crazy simple and intuitive. Their control panel is very powerful, but if you want to even go beyond that, they've got a straightforward API that you can take advantage of. DigitalOcean has also recently rolled out IPv6 in some of their data centers, Core OS, private networking. It gets better and better and better. One of the things I love about the private networking is not only does that allow you to build the etcd uh, cluster you're going to need to configure your core OS rigs, but it also allows you to have, say, a front-end web server with a back-end database server that isn't exposed to the internet, and the best part is there's no charge for the transfer over that private link. That's how awesome DigitalOcean is. Something else that's kind of cool, and another great reason to hold on to Unplug September, you can also do hourly pricing over at DigitalOcean. This is super useful if you're doing testing, and you need to do it up in somewhere that actually has decent performance, where a lot of people can get to it, and you can turn it on, turn it off, take snapshots, deploy, redeploy. This is a great use of their hourly pricing structure. It's so awesome, and their control panel makes it crazy easy to just get up and going. DigitalOcean.com. Unplug September when you check out. And a big thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. I'll tell you, I keep spinning up droplets. I kept, I say, oh, I really need to do that one thing. And I'll like uh, spin up a droplet. It's oh, great. Yeah. Oh, Love yeah. Them. Okay, so um, Aaron Saigo lit the world on fire via <laughs> Google Plus yesterday at 3.01 a.m. <laughs> I don't know why he's posting at 3.01 a.m., but that's when he was. Mm. And, he, right, and I'm just going to read a few highlights. Okay. Um, and then we can get into the meat and potatoes of it here. He says, here we go. Flamethrowers on, everyone. Here's what I feel. The community manager role that is increasingly common in the free software world is a fraud and a farce. The community manager role is a fraud and a farce, he says. If, you're, if your community has a quote-unquote manager, then it's being treated as a community, then it isn't being treated as a community and probably isn't a community to begin with. Community has an actual meaning that transcends a crowd. Community is a structure derived from the self-determination of shared values. Communities don't have managers. Synthetic organized hierarchical organizations do. Nearly all community managers in free software ecosystems work for companies that own and manage products that that community they are managing are built around, and that's not a coincidence communities, real ones, have facilitators and leaders of various forms and stripes. It's okay they get pay- it's okay if they do get paid and if they're able to spend time and energy facilitating and leading, but they damn sure are not managers of the community. They are accountable to the community, selected by the community, and drive their influence from the community consensus and can be replaced by the community at the community's behest. Does that sound like the free software community managers you know? I'd be fine in the situation if there was some honesty on the ground about this, because then we wouldn't be tainting the word community for those blessed souls who have managed to actually erect the real deal. There wouldn't be quite so many deluded individuals out there. 
who think that they're a true stakeholder with equitable rights and privileges in the actual community. In summary, a community manager is really an audience handler, as in they handle you as members of their audience, as part of their marketing program. And frankly, I've run out of patience for this deception. Now get off my lawn. Matt, I'll open the yeah, floor to you. So, um, so I don't subscribe to his, uh, his thoughts or his feed um, for obvious reasons. Um, I, you know, because personally, so let, let's, let's take a step back and let's go to this thing called Wikipedia and let's look at what the term community is. A community is a social unit of any size that shares common values, period. Okay. Why is it a problem to have a, a, a name of manager or facilitator or reach around guy or whatever you want to call them <laughs> that, that comes in and, and facilitates, I don't know, something we like to call communication between a large mob of people and in some cases a company or in some cases, I don't know, the developers. Fun fact, developers and end users don't always speak the same language. Sometimes it requires a manager to come in and help facilitate that line of communication. It, his post was the biggest pile of drivel I've ever read in my entire life. He's a nice guy. I like him. But this pissed me off. It was absolute nonsense. Absolute crap. I couldn't even wrap my head around I, I'm hoping he was drunk because it's like, was he just out <laughs> to pick a fight? I mean, he's such a nice guy. And I, I mean, I like the guy. I do. But I, he's just so negative about nothing. It's like, oh, my God, relax. Take a pill. Go get stoned. Do something. I, but just work. I, I do wonder, like, I think. Wow. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I think part of the problem is, is like, um, the term community manager can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different groups and businesses. Bingo. And so yeah. you can't blanket hate on just one term. I mean, it, it might not be the right manager, might not be the, the right word. So I. I'll take uh, the opposite. I'll play devil's advocate here, and uh, and I will. I I don't know if it is fair to compare the community of Jupiter Broadcasting to the community of, say, a well a, a, a well established open source product uh, project. I don't know if that's fair or not. I would guess. I actually w I I would guess the Jupiter Broadcasting community size probably dwarfs m many open source projects that aren't like super famous, right? I would easily. Yeah. So uh, I you know we have a huge community, huge. And um, I very consciously have chosen to, whenever we start up a, a new aspect of the community somewhere, to generally sort of wind my involvement down. I'll, I'll kind of, I don't know if manage is the right, curate. I'll curate the community there for a bit and then sort of wind myself down as I notice certain uh, personalities in the community sort of stand up and take on leadership exactly. roles. Not even leadership yeah. roles so much as much as like just... Uh, you know, I, I I don't know how to explain it. I, I really don't. But like, let's take uh, let's take this mumble room that we're all in right now. This is right. something that Blaster, on his own initiative, went out and created, and and now he is the operator of our mumble room. I right. I didn't set that up. Blaster set that up, and everybody knows that it's Blaster's creation here, and that that is. That is, in my opinion, community taking on their own leadership in, in a much more organic and real way than when you have an artificial manager who really kind of more ends up playing PR guy and try to smooth things over and a lot of times kind of keeps the community at arm's length from the business. So the business is allowed to make the decisions it needs to make to be a profitable business and then the community manager ends up being the guy who tries to sell it to the community and tells everybody we're having a great time and it's really because of your participation that it's all working out. And I, oh, that absolutely. drives me crazy. Yeah. It does, and that's the that's the mark of a poor community manager. If you're if you're if you're working on stuff like Operation Lightning Rod, which I've actually known people that worked on an operation called Operation Lightning Rod as a community manager, it exists. Um, if you're in those situations, yeah, that that's a bad situation to be in, and that's honestly a bad role to be in. But at the end of the day, they're like if something happens with Jupiter Broadcasting, generally speaking, you or Angela or maybe even one of the producers will reach out to the community and say, "Hey, by the way, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing." Yeah. There's some there's some information passed. Right. I, we have a more distributed system where there's right. Exactly. Yeah. There's producers and staff and and right. but um, but generally speaking, you take on that role a lot of it. Especially, it's like, "Hey, by the way, this is being rescheduled," or "Hey, we're going to be having this guest on," or "We're going to be right. doing that." You're going to be making that communication happen. You do need some kind of leadership in some fashion, and sometimes it does fall to a person that is hired for such a role. I, it yeah. really just depends. So I, I do agree that you you when you get to a certain size, it does become easier to just make it a person's responsibility because yeah. it can be one of the things that gets neglected, and and also that sort of fits in better with how businesses are structured. All right, well this is right. this right. is your responsibility, Bob, and you're going to manage the community. 
Um, but I wonder if maybe there isn't a bit of a different approach that needs to be taken when you are deriving some of your success from the fruits of labor of that community. I like, think there needs to be a guide. I think there needs to be like a commu- – like th- everybody gets together, including the communities themselves, to say, look, here's how not to be a D-bag when you're, d- when you're talking to us. Here's, guess- here's how to actually have like a level of – go because a lot of times you are talking about like let's say Red Hat and uh, the Fedora Project or whatever it may be. You, can- you do need someone in between those things to actually make that conversation happen. Let's, uh, I, I've lived in this world for a long time. You just do. Let's toss it to Popey. I'd like yeah. to hear your thoughts on this, Popey. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I I read uh, Aaron's post and and I could see I can see an argument there that that's worthwhile. I can see how it could be misconstrued that someone who works for a corporate entity who tries to rally people around and basically do their bidding for them for free mm-hmm. uh, is not a pleasant person to be, right? Sure. And and I, and I I can I can see how there's a good argument for that that being. Uh, not an appropriate person you know, in a community. It's a, it's not a community person, but I I would flip that around and say that, that I would I would say a company who is comprised of a bunch of people who aren't necessarily close to the community, who have a product that is used by a wide community of people, there needs to be an interface between them. And you, you, you know, if you if you hire people in the company who have never worked in an open source company, you you've got to be able to interface those people to these random drive by community contributors and say, look, this guy who just fixed a typo in your code, he's trustworthy. He's a good guy. You know, you should you should right. accept that he code can, contribution. He can be. He could. That person could serve as an advocate for the community. Sure. Right. Or, or it could be just a drive by edit, and they're gone. And then you'll never see them again. They were just scratching an itch because in their language, that word didn't make sense. So they fixed it, right? I do Uh, feel like the core argument that Aaron's getting at, that there has been a quote unquote, like perversion of what the term means and what that role does. I get really, I think for a lot of companies becomes uh, the, this is a lot of times uh, companies grow and all of a sudden the community almost becomes like their view of them changes and the community goes shifts from asset to liability and now it's like this thing we need to manage that way they don't damage our public perception and we need you know and it becomes like this distorted time of this it's not community management so much as is keeping the community sort of boxed and 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 that's not a good thing i can see how that that perception can happen because i you know i've seen that that happen and i've seen people being labeled as you know the pr guy or you know the the guy who fixes when you know uh, when yeah, yeah. when there's a when a, when there's a problem in the community from my from my perspective I, that's that's not the role i play um but you know i can see how that could be seen um the problem is that a lot of people outside of like a particular community, and obviously I'm speaking from experience of the Ubuntu community, look in and only see someone with a public face like Jono, for example, and only see his public blog posts and his public, right. you know, conversations right. with people and right. think that's all he does. Right, doesn't see the day-to-day. Right, yeah. and, and, the, and the, like, the full calendar he had talking to i'm not talking in the past tense as, as if he's dead but you know just because he's no longer with the company <laughs> the late um, the late john bacon yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, he yeah. you know he had a calendar that was full of meetings with people inside the company making sure that the community's um needs were addressed and that any decision that was made in the company was made with full thought and respect for what the community wanted and you know whatever name you give that role right yeah manager he's got people under him in the company okay he's a manager he deals with the community a lot yeah okay let's put the word community in there right 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 you can you can futz around with the with the job title yeah but the fact is that he's a very pro community guy who is who is doing his best to interface a corporate entity with a community of contributors who are doing what they're doing willingly and they can walk away at any time and they do you know Right. I, I, I find I, I I object to Aaron's post mostly because I think he has a very blinkered view of the term community manager and what a community manager is. Bingo. Yeah, I I mean I, I totally <laughs> see it from the and when you when you get it when you come at it from the inside of how a business works, like it, it makes so much more sense versus when you look at it from the outside where you just kinda end up seeing them continually play that that PR buffer zone. And I I look at this and I think 
there is a lot of ways you can parse this. There's a lot of ways you can change around the terms, but I wanted to give Daredevil a chance to kind of get in because I know he's had a couple of thoughts on this. So Daredevil, is that is, is the semantics of this something you wanted to touch on? Yes, because I don't think even the term is applied to to the community. I also think that the post is uh, uh, is actually looking at the community creating and forming itself around the company when actually a lot of times the companies go and join the communities that already exist. And it's like making the post is under the impression that the community is dependent on the company when it's most of the time the other way around. It can always go on their own and suddenly there's no point. And I see the manager to be actually a manager for the company mm. as yes. like like Poppy pointed mm -hmm. out. So I, I, I completely don't... agree. And like I yeah. get people PM me on IRC and say, hey, I've seen this uh, Ubuntu phone thing. I'd like to help out. What what can I do? And my response, you know, I'm the right person they should come to because I, I can point them in the right direction, right? Is that a community manager? Well, that's not what my business card says, but, <laughs> you know, that's that's you know, th that's arguably what I'm doing. People yeah. are coming to me and saying, hey, I'd like to contribute and I say, well, what do you know? What do you want? To, what do you feel passionate about? What do you want to contribute to? And that, and these are people who, you know, have lives. They've got other jobs. They've got families. They've got other stuff they need to be doing. But they're willing to contribute to uh, a product that's made by a corporation. You know, and mm -hmm. and if they're willing to do that, yeah, they can walk away at any time. If they're willing to do that and they want to contribute, then it makes sense for the company to have someone who is a, a point of contact for them, someone who can facilitate that conversation and find the bugs that that person can fix or uh, poke the right people inside the company in order to fast track a bug through or release a piece of software or whatever it is. Sure. That's what the community manager does. It's not like running around the streets, grabbing, press ganging people off the streets and putting an Emacs in front of them and saying, you, code for me now. Yeah. That's your job now and you work for me, bitch. What? That's not what a community manager is. No, and that's no. what it seems that Aaron... Not last time I held the position? No, uh, actually, it wasn't. I, Eric, no. I, I wanted to give Eric a chance to chime in because, Eric, I, I, I know that you've done a lot of work with community management and taken training in it specifically. Do you think, mm -hmm. do you agree with Aaron's point that... The term community is sort of being muddied down here. It's getting sort of distorted by these corporations and not and it's sort of devaluing the term community and what it actually means. Do you think that's an issue? I think it depends on the corporation. Basically, you you've got a lot of volunteer management going on or community management as it call, it's called. You still have to have somebody who's acting as a liaison between the community and the company. Uh, when that person becomes a PR person, that's where it's getting a little fuzzy. The person does have to inspire the community to do better things, but at the same time, they also need to be pointing the community toward the vision of the company and saying, this is kind of what we have in mind. Do you guys like this? And here's why we think this is a good idea, blah, blah, blah. So it's it, it, there's a lot to it. Yeah. Um, it. There's a lot to it more than being a PR guy. Right. A lot to it more than just talking to the community. It's all. It's a lot of trying to vision cast, as I call it, the the vision of the company to the community at large. That's a huge part. Hmm. Okay. And also getting getting them involved in in company events as well. Mm. You know, the the community manager yeah. in the past in Ubuntu would. Um, send out all the invites and figure out who were the the kind of people that you needed at an Ubuntu developer summit and would send out invites to like 100 people to get them along and get them involved in conversations and planning about what's happening in the next release and I've just had to do this I've invited a bunch of people to come to a sprint in Washington to help us form Ubuntu Phone. And these, these are people, yeah, they're giving up their own time to come along and help us figure out what a free software phone should look like in mm -hmm, the future. Mm -hmm. And and you need someone to do the the crappy work of figuring out what flights they can go on, working out what their <laughs> visa requirements. Yeah, very true. Trust me, yeah. I've I've had to do this. I totally so know. yeah, this is exactly what a community manager does. It's not it's nowhere near as nefarious as Aaron makes it out to be. It might be in I some agree. companies, but not in my experience. Yeah, well, I guess well, that's the difference is when you get assigned community manager as your job title, what do they have in mind for you? Is is your job to, you know, mollify the community and keep them from sending hate mail to the company or right, is it right. to uh get the most out of the community right. that you can to to you know get as many of those people involved and actually 
forwarding the, the project along or what? I would say the latter, Alan. That's well, huge. I would well, say I'd all say the above. Each, it's different with each company what they're yeah. – why yeah, they decided point. they right. needed a community manager. That's, that's why it's not black and white, because it is literally different for every single uh, case. Exactly. Well, it's, it's ambiguous. It's, been, it's, it's ambiguous. become a buzzword for a job title that could mean anything from... I remember when the first time I heard it, it was when a company hired someone to manage like a forum about something. Yeah, see, this yeah. is I, I this is the part of Aaron's <laughs> post that, I, that registers with me, is this has actually bothered... These kinds of things have bothered me for a while. Uh, Alan, since you're here... Would you? Would you? Can you give us an overview of how this works for FreeBSD? They, I, you guys have assigned um, liaisons. Is that how it works? Not really. Like there are certain people who volunteer to oh, okay. try to be that matchmaker type person, like Popey was describing. Uh, there's, uh, I think it's FreeBSD help on a couple of their Twitter accounts that when they see somebody tweet, "I'm having this problem with FreeBSD" or whatever, they'll, you know, be like, "Hey, well, does this help? You know, make sure you file a PR or." Mm -hmm. Oh, that thing you're asking about. Well, why don't you talk to this person who's the guy that worked on that most recently or whatever, kind of like Puppy was describing. But, you know, the FreeBSD Foundation doesn't pay someone to, to do that. Gotcha. Uh, all right. Well, I wanted to get uh, I want to I want to cover Mark Shuttleworth's response because I actually really liked his response to Aaron's post. And uh, as you'd expect on one of Aaron's uh, provocative Google Plus posts, the the uh, comment thread is about a mile long. And just as I was about to abort because I was getting a little burned out on the comments, I saw Mark Shuttleworth dragon and I had to read his post. So we'll uh, we'll read what Mark Shuttleworth had to say. But first, I want to thank. Ting. Go over to linux.ting.com. That's right, linux.ting.com. That'll take $25 off your first Ting device. If you already got a Ting compatible device, too, they'll give you a $25 credit. That's also a great option to go if you're going to get one of their dedicated data units, like a little LTE hotspot device. So what is Ting? Well, Ting is truly mobile that is different. No contract, no early termination fee, and you only pay for what you use. Flat $6 for the line, plus the, the taxes the man's going to take. And then it's just your usage. Ting takes your minutes, your messages, your megabytes. They add them all up at the end of the month, whatever bucket you fall into. That's what you pay. It's so much better than paying for the amount of minutes and data and text you may or may not use. That's such a freaking ripoff. And the best part is, too, like if, you, if you've been feeling what a ripoff that is and you're like, okay, it's time to do something differently, you can go over to linux.ting.com, try out their savings calculator, get an idea of what you'll save over like the two-year contract period that you'll be getting away from. And if you're ready to make the jump but you're still in the contract, well, Ting has an early termination relief program, ting.com slash ETF, where they'll help pay $75 per line that you have to get canceled. That just sort of supercharges your transition over to Ting. And if you are an Apple user and you have an iPhone 5S or 5C, Ting has launched the countdown to when you can bring the 5S or 5C over to the Ting network, which is a great option if you are on that device now because you can take it and just get even more use out of it. And if you're thinking about getting perhaps a different phone down the road, you could take this iPhone and convert it over to Ting and then just pay for what you use. What a great opportunity. What a great way to get value out of it. I've got the Nexus 5 on the Ting Network, too. Matt's got the Note 2. They both absolutely rock. I love the Ting Network paired with the Ting devices because then you own them outright. They're yours. You never have to worry about getting screwed in a contract. They have an amazing dashboard. No hold customer service at one ting ftw anytime between 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. East Coast time. And a real person answers the phone linux.ting.com linux.ting.com will give you $25 credit if you got a compatible device like the iPhone 5 uh, S5, 5S or 5C or any of the devices available on the Ting store lots of good stuff linux.ting.com check them out maybe even give them a call see, uh, see just how great that customer service is and a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged Okay, guys, let's parse uh, Mark Shuttleworth's uh, response to Aaron Saigo. Mark Shuttleworth right. wrote, from my perspective, the great people in this kind of role really love the people and the project and help unblock things which would otherwise cause a project to stagnate. It's perfectly possible to stick a fraudulent label on a job. Yes, there are companies that think they can get people to work for them if they have a manager for those people. But those cases usually don't work out very well. By contrast, Invest in people who love both the goals of a huge project and the opportunity to work with folks who can only participate part-time, and some magic happens. That's worth, inv that's worth investing in, in my opinion. <laughs> I like that he leaves the H off. I like Mark's like, I'm not going to put H in that. Uh, so <laughs> John o. Michael, David, Daniel, and others are wonderful to work with, and I'm very proud of the things they've done and the things they've enabled to get done by others. Whatever label people might try to attach to them, those are my heroes. He said something in this post, pretty short, but something that I think is perhaps the most, the most realistic, like day-to-day -day 
task that a good community advocate or manager or organizer has to do is a lot of times an open source project, there's a lot of people in your community who come and go. They can't they can't contribute a lot of hours. They can only, and if if they are on a regular basis, it's very limited. And so because of their time constraints, they need an enabler to help them when they do have the time. And that is a critical role that 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 community manager, whatever you want to call it, could play. And at the end of the day, that is truly about enabling people in your community to help work with you. And it, it, it really is a two-way street in that case. And that, that kind of thing, I think, is a great example of a good role a community manager can have. Uh, any closing thoughts, you guys, on this before we uh, wrap up? Well, that just tells think- me that Canonical has a great idea of where they want to go with community. and Or, or at least Mark Shuttleworth does. And since <laughs> he is the dictator as it were then sure <laughs> well and of course aaron did reply to mark if you guys want to see aaron's response to markets further down in the comments what were you going to say matt I, I was basically just going to point out when when we see things like this two two things that you know first of all when you start off with just a really ugly title like that you know fraud and all this stuff you've lost me already so even if he has like relevant points throughout the the article you, you lost me at the title just ugly ugly stuff um the the end, the end point that people need to remember with stuff like this is that you know, it's apples and oranges with every company, every community. There are some real d bags that are just total placeholders in certain companies, and they exist. And I realize this, but there's a lot of times where these people are doing this stuff because they actually started out as members of the community that were perhaps brought in to fill a void, mm-hmm. and they have a really unfortunate title. Oh no, it's got the word manager in it. Maybe we can call him the community advocate or the community hug guy or something. <laughs> I don't know, but whatever makes people feel warm and fuzzy. But at the end of the day, they have a critical role. If it's a company you want to do business with, or if it's a community that you want to be part of, if it's not, go away. Yeah, that would be my. That'd be I, my uh, message. I walk away mostly, mostly thinking, you know, you can't make it black and white. But I, I still remain slightly skeptical of the position. I think it in my in my case, it's I wait and see. Actions speak louder than words, and I'll treat each case yeah. individually. There you go. Yeah, because yeah. like I said, there are some exceptions. There's some real D-bags out there. I'm not debating that at all. <laughs> but um, there really no. are. I mean, no, I don't think anybody's <laughs> in debate on that topic. I think we all pretty much agree. The internet is full of D-bags. Uh, Matt, so that's going to wrap up the show today. Actually, we yeah. do have a we do have a post show topic. So if uh, you're going to be listening after the music, stick around for that. I'm curious to hear what you think about this next topic coming up. But Matt, yep. on Sunday, I got two different topics that I'm brewing right now to see which one completes. And whichever one finishes first will be the one we roll with on Sunday. But I'm, I like both of them as much, so we'll eventually do both of them. But I'm not sure which one we're going to do first. Tune in on Sunday and find out with us. JBLive.tv Sunday 10 a.m. Uh, or just come back here next Tuesday. JBLive.tv. We do this show. In the afternoons, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get it in your local time zone. All right, Matt. Well, I'll see you on Sunday, okay? All right, see you then. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday. companies out there right now that are sort of in this transition phase like Amazon's really developing into something interesting too like with the uh, Fire Phone and the t- tablets and they seem to be having some success with the Fire tablets I and mean, we don't really know but they seem to be Yeah Fire Phone seems to be flopping I think part of that is because it's only available yeah. on AT&T But then you got the Fire TV which from all accounts seems to be a pretty credible product I'm tempted to pick one up one day myself uh, also Android based, right? And then so you've got, and then you've got like folks like Apple that are like slowly turning out this TV stuff. It's really like in this weird phase where like they're entering into watches, they're entering into TVs, and they're entering into home automation stuff, which we've really just seen the very beginnings of. Uh, and I, I'm just kind of watching all this. I'm thinking, guess you all are kind of working against each other, and it, it because of that, none of it really um, appeals to me because like I don't want to be stranded in one person's ecosystem. Or in one company's ecosystem. This is why the watches don't appeal to me, because you know I I don't want to have to you know buy a watch that only not works part, with, yeah. buy a specific yeah. phone. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's no fun to me. Yeah, well, and that's why I was glad to jump ship from Apple when I did. And I think you know, I mean, the Android Wear has the advantage of you can move it between different Android devices, but I I don't even like that restriction, which kind of means I'm screwed. I think unless I'm just happy with something like the Pebble, and that's not a really a compelling device to me personally, although. I know Chase really likes his, um, but 
I I, I kind of want to I want to want this stuff because yeah. I do want some of the convenience they offer. At the same time, I just uh, I'm so sick of the lock in. Yeah, I sit back and wait. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people in the GNU world would say you don't want to give up your freedom like that. WikiLeaks says well, Google is a disgusting ad selling hypocrite company that pretends not to be evil when their entire business is based on having and using your personal information. Ouch. I don't know if they're hypocrites, though. I think they're kind of upfront about that. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are. They'll, they'll tell you like it is. I guess we're all kind of negative on the watch thing. Really? Nobody in here wants a watch? I, I wouldn't mind an Android one, but I mean, I I'm not going to spend dummy. that much money on a watch. I just want the dummy watch. Something yeah. that is able to receive a few instructions from something remote. Uh, and I don't think, like, a watch having processing capabilities is going to be of, me of really any good use. I think it's kind of a device to use as a gateway yeah. to any other, like, company or place that you are in. And just m m maybe some very simple functionality. But mostly a receiving. I think, you know, there, I, what I want is something I could do messaging. And the problem is that, and I don't want advanced messaging. I just want something that does voice dictation or voice notes. Uh, and that's when you get. Where would you use that? Huh? Seriously, where where would you use voice dictation on a on a on a watch? What do you mean? When I'm driving. Right. So why would you not use your phone? Well, or normally phone? I have my phone in my pocket, which is just kind of like you know right there anyway. So yeah, I could just grab it. The thing is. Uh, when I'm driving, sometimes I have like the phone in a spot where my uh, my audio is actually connected to a Bluetooth system, and so then I'm using a different microphone that doesn't work as well for the dictation. Whereas if the mic was built into the watch and I could speak more clearly into it, I think it would work better. Okay. What are you yeah, on about? Sense. You won't be driving for too long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> see, there's okay. So this is the other thing where I don't I mean I don't get don't want to get all like Zen Master about it, but like I I think we've already crossed a threshold with our smartphones. Okay, I think. Okay, all right. So I, don't you guys feel like, like, do you guys go to restaurants and stuff and like you look around and everybody's got their face in their phone and maybe it's getting, yep. a, it's going on, it's gone a little too far and that, yep. and that sometimes like, do you get the sensation that maybe people are like avoiding like being alone with their thoughts for 30 seconds and don't, jumping in their phone so that way they don't have to deal with, you know, being a human being or something like that. Like it, I, I have watched the progression over the last five years where, like, I, I remember a time where it was kind of considered inappropriate to have your phone at the dinner table in a restaurant. And that was kind yeah. of, like, considered bad taste. And now I go out and everybody's buried in it. And it happens everywhere I go. I do it. My friends do it. My family does it. Everybody's got their faces buried in these phones. And I'm thinking, geez, we already are so distracted that we don't even look up and just like look up at the moon one day. We're always looking in our phones. And so I, I, I worry that these watches and especially things like Google Glass take it so much further that it it actually isn't maybe healthy for the way our minds process information. And it could leave us like, I think, over sensitized or over exposed to this stuff. I, I don't, for example, particularly want Google Now notifications on my watch. In fact, I'm thinking about turning Google Now off. So then that so, sort of pretty much makes an Android Wear useless. Well, when I look at it, I see two things. I see one that uh, mo modern work environment and people have to relocate. That's kind of why those gadgets feel a gap that it's right there. It's like people are going to another state to, or, or living in another country for large periods of time. And those devices do feel a gap that they have. That's a real gap. That's the real modern world. And that's when you find most people. But people that are just on the local, uh, uh, sharing with people that they know and live nearby, um, uh, it seems that when some time passes, they eventually uh, start gradually decreasing the usage, especially hmm. among friends. Hmm. Least that's, that has been my experience. It's like people got just uh, bloated of, so it was new. Amazing. It was it was shiny. Yeah, yeah. I can exactly. see that. Exactly. Maybe. But if you if you're dealing with some with re actual remote uh, relationships, then it fills a gap. So you will find that. And also, like when you go to to a restaurant, you're kind of already doing something that it's remote. Gradually, with age, te people technically, uh, depending on the country, of course, but culturally, also start moving to eating at home, eating family, eating with friends. Yeah. And 
it's not so much the restaurant thing either. So um, I wonder if these watches will, will could these watches become podcast clients? Could this be a way to listen to podcasts where you don't have to bring your phone if you want to go on a walk? I would be all down. Well, of course, you have to have your phone with these phones, with these watches, right? All of them require your phone. Yep. What happens if they don't they they can't operate on their own just with minimum functionality, local functionality? I think they would like just timekeeping and whatnot. Well, and maybe media playback. Like if you could, uh, if you could, uh, you know, put a Bluetooth headphone in or, or or whatever and listen to a podcast while you're on a walk and not need your phone. I would love that. I think yeah, it would last this, like 10 minutes. This, um, <laughs> will actually push uh, further for mesh networks of Wi Fi networks. Oh, man. Wouldn't that be badass if everybody's watch formed a secured mesh network? <laughs> well, why not just ah. do that now with phones, right? Again, well, we go back to the, You could just go with you're, phone. You're wasting battery over something important. Right? No, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All and right. Leaves you your phone available for uh, as a communications device. Yeah, and also like we're we're gra- we're now at the current stage of uh, software as a service that companies do have an incentive of having you connected at all times, not just through data plans of telecom, because uh, ultimately a lot of other things will start to factor in, like because the amount of devices is also huge, um, and the expansion is not as quickly if you're relying on just the the. The, the telephone operators. True, right? true. I, the last time I had a watch, they were called Swatch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and before that, it was a calculator watch. Yeah, and I think yeah. that was the 80s. I'm just not a real watch guy. I do know, kind of feel not. like, actually, there's a point to that. Like, I kind of feel like maybe that I was, yeah. I think when the smartphone came out, I was like, oh, finally, I don't have to wear a watch. Right? I mean, I don't know. It's just something for, else for me to break. I don't know. Well, there's that. And charge every night. Don't forget that, too. Right. Oh, gosh, no kidding. There is the problem with that as well. That's I, it. I really contactless chargers and uh, your desks and place workplace being filled with those chargers everywhere is what you're saying. Yeah, but yeah. then it's actually not as so when you take the watch off, like in the case of the uh, Apple Watch, it like doesn't uh, it deauthorizes your capability for payments. It doesn't track your health stats. Like it becomes <laughs> significantly less useful when you take it off your body, which you have to do at least once a day. Yeah. When the hell are we going to get decent but batteries? What do you want to pay when you're sleeping, though? People are trying on the battery front. They yeah. really are. Whatever happened to that wow. one battery that it was actually a capacitor invented by a teenager that lasts, like, for all day, if not more? Uh, he was murdered by the oil industry, and then they destroyed the... Yeah. No, I'm oh, kidding. <laughs> no, actually, no, no, no. Him and water car guy went up to yeah, another... water car guy! <laughs> um, so you know, you asked, what would you? Why would you want to wear your watch at night? Um, I track oh, with a Fitbit. I track my quality of sleep, so I know how I'm doing with my sleep apnea. And so uh, I actually a, a, a crucial part of the Fitbit is the functionality I use for it while I'm sleeping. It's actually I probably would consider that more important than the step tracking for me. So you were Makes saying sense. that there are people who are sat in restaurants out of the house who can't stop with the digital connectivity. Oh, yeah. You and don't see You're this? doing it oh, in yeah. your sleep. Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not staring at a screen, though, and I'm not distracted by it. It's different. It's more actually what I like about yeah, it. Yeah, that's it's, different. That's it's, completely different. Well, because my point is, like, it's passive tracking. You go in and get the data when you want, but these phones and these watches are active, require your attention, distract you from the fact that uh, something's bad in your mind that you're not paying attention to, or, you know, they're like uh, these these yeah, bursts was... of, like, uh, indulgence on, uh, like, let me take a selfie and make sure I get some. Um, Mike's kind of and... pulling your plunker a bit. But I can but see what I, you're saying. I was, I, was, I was at a wedding a couple of weeks ago, and it was in the middle of nowhere, and there was no cell reception at all, and there was no Wi-Fi. Nobody had their phone out other than for taking photos of the bride and groom. The rest of the time, everyone was talking, dancing, drinking, having fun. Wow. Nobody okay, that's had a good their thing. phone out. It was amazing. It was, one, it was the best wedding. Aside from the fact it was a fabulous steak, it was the best <laughs> wedding I've been to for a long time. We are now reactivating the Wi-Fi. You may now turn your smartphones back on, and everybody got quiet. Should have a Faraday cage over places so you don't connect to internet. No, we have trees <laughs> into the countryside. That'll work. That'll do That'll it work. up here too sometimes. I, I so was in I the ER and I couldn't make a phone call out. That is so a I weird guess, thing. Yeah. The deal is okay. I need to open a company that just sets up uh, uh, signal blockers for weddings and events. Yeah, yeah. No, they have those already. We have a post show topic. This is an interesting one. In fact, I didn't put it in the main show. Because I've noticed almost zero discussion online about it. It seems like nobody gives a crap. And I care. So I just wanted to ask. It's it's probably important. Usually it's the stupid crap that everybody gets all 
test you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like U2 albums being auto downloaded to phones and yeah. things like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh my God. All right. uh, uh, Chris, can I, can I just say photo. that I, I personally guarantee if you buy an Ubuntu phone, we won't force Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. you. All right. All right. Deal. <laughs> deal. All right. So speaking of buying stuff, uh, nice. Uh, Micro Focus has bought Attachmate for two point three billion. Of course, Attachmate is the company that owns SUSE Linux. Oh, that is kind of a big deal, don't yeah. you think? But yeah, I like. Although, yeah, I well, think SUSE so. SUSE Linux is what percentage of Attachmate, though? Not that much, but I, I suppose it's still yes, it matters. Well, I don't know. That might. That's well, what my concern is. Is maybe it doesn't matter to them because they make their money off mainframes and writing COBOL apps. That's mm. that's where they make their money. Link. Yes, they mm. sell Open Visual Caesar COBOL. Have, that's interesting. Yeah. Open Caesar have posted. Uh, their response to say basically nothing changes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I mean, it seems like it would be complimentary to a mainframe business. I mean, it. I mean, yeah. they've they've got a good strong position there in the market. Well, so. yeah. Attachmate Group owns SUSE, uh, Novell, and Attachmate. Attachmate is based in Seattle. Novell is based in Provo, Utah, and uh, SUSE is based in Germany. So it's kind of mm-hmm. an interesting thing they just picked up. So they say, yeah, no changes for SUSE are planned. The business structure and leadership remain. There's no need for any action taken. Uh, commitment to open source, SUSE remains passionately committed to open innovation. Commitment to open SUSE is fully committed to being a sponsor and supporter of open, highly independent. Okay, so I'll just kind of boilerplate. Yeah, uh, well, it sounds like well, uh, Attachment bought Novell, and then turns out that yeah. didn't make them any money. Right, right. And so then they had to sell because they had to pay back those loans. Yeah, well, and they sold off a bunch of patents, so... <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you yeah, go. There you go. There's that. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Yeah. So there you go. Now, there really was not much to say, is there? It just seems to be a non, really. kind it's of a non big deal. Yeah. As long as business continues for the SUSE project, I think everybody's happy. Do you think the the constant sale of Novell and SUSE devalues the SUSE brand? Yeah. I think it's weird too. I think it's weird that it keeps getting shuffed, you know, pushed around like a hooker. It's Everybody right. thinks that they can make money with it, but it turns out they can't. Well, but that kind of makes it sound like Seuss is a loser. Well, she sounds well, like a hooker isn't. with a PayPal swipe. I don't know. You know, at the end of the day, everybody, might... think, everybody wants to be this, the next Red Hat because Red Hat made billions, right? And Yeah. You know, though, I mean, for all we know, it has nothing to do with Seuss. Maybe Seuss is the only thing that makes right. any money at all. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Uh, in this case, it's it's you know a line item that's kind of buried in there. And... Well, you know, Seuss is way that's bigger right than off. Red Hat over in Europe. I mean, way bigger. Yeah. So if you're if you're putting a SAP ERP system in, you're either gonna if you're gonna put it on Linux, you're either gonna put it on Red Hat or SUSE. If you're in the US, that's probably Red Hat. If you're in Europe, possibly SUSE. Do you So yeah, you it could be some big iron. You asked me, but SUSE. you didn't answer the question yourself. Do you think it devalues the SUSE brand? I think it kinda does. It it does kind of it, it's like the blue-headed stepchild or the green-headed stepchild that <laughs> right. keeps getting pushed Feels around. Feels like sloppy seconds post. to me. Well, and, the, yes. and then the other thing exactly. is, is like when you're trying to pick an enterprise platform to base like your entire server infrastructure on, stability of the company is a major component. In fact, some people will pick the stability of the company, IBM or Microsoft, over the stability of the actual software product. Right. Yep. Oh, that's scary. Yeah, and so when you see this keep moving around, it, it, start, it casts doubts because you never know if the next time it changes hands, if that'll be the time they decide to end it, right? You just never know. And, and maybe that would never be the case. I don't know. And I actually think the Enterprise product's a really good product, too. So it, it seems like it should be a moneymaker, but I think this uh, damn Ubuntu uh, LTS thing came around and sort of ate their lunch in the cloud. Yeah, big time. Son of a gun. All right, so... Oh, it's, uh, it's interesting to look at Linux's version of long-term support and see how different it is from... <laughs> Uh, oh, more, here uh, we what go. companies actually look for? Comes, there's it, a it turns out that <laughs> the companies actually want like insane levels of long-term support. Yeah, like they want to stick with one version for ten years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, like is, banks running is, Windows even, 2000 kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux and CentOS are around for like freaking ever because they have, well, they're they're almost support. five years, I think. No, yeah. more than that. We're like talking like seven or eight. Well, oh, well, FreeBSD does five, but in CentOS is right. the same. But Xenuous is basically making their version of FreeBSD that has ten plus years of support. Yeah, I think that's meant insane. to compete with HPUX and all that other stuff. Well, it's, like it's, support for like fifty it's specifically years or to replace, insane. It's specifically to replace the product they already have, which was Sco. So you can actually you can actually pay for what they call extended life support on uh, Red Hat. Well, you actually get you actually get patches for thirteen years. Yeah, but you got to pay out the butt for it. Uh, like like five thousand dollars per server or something like that. Is that actually wow. a radio button on their webpage? <laughs> the, the the butt charge. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, I like uh, uh, GNU news is good news. I also like uh, 
uh, community D debate. I like all of the I like all the system D references. <laughs> Man, the people yeah, who trolling. the people who disagreed with our overall uh, end opinion on our system D discussion, I were really upset by that. Did you guys see we had? Like, I didn't. Re- I haven't gone back in there, oh, but yeah. that oh, yeah. that yeah, feedback was... thread's like a record setter for Linux unplugged in the uh, sub. Yeah, Does it make me evil thing. that I actually popped popcorn for that when I was reading? <laughs> <laughs> that, that That's what I should real... do. I did too. I literally did because I just found it so amusing. I mean, I, yeah, I, I didn't mean to insult anybody. Uh, no. I, yeah, I just, uh, just the interesting uh, views. It's just like, okay. And the thing is, is like, I don't know what these people think my background is, but like, I've managed servers for a really long time, and I think System D is a great advancement for server management. So when I see these server guys that go in there like, I don't want it for my server, I'm like, are you kidding? I want yeah, it for my you, servers. What are you smoking? <laughs> Yeah, I, just, I don't get it. All right, so I'm going to refresh the vote page. And I mean, I understand. Like, honestly, I don't want to force anything on anybody. If they want to use OpenRC or whatever, have at it. I don't, I'm fine with it. Well, here's the problem everyone always gets so fired up about it. And what they really need to be talking about is. <laughs>